there's a lot of things that happen in your life that you can't choose. There, there's losses, there's abuse, there's traumas, there's, there's all sorts of things that happen in your life that you, you have no choice over. But the one thing that can never be taken away from you is your ability to choose how to respond. My name is Terry Wise and I'm the author of a book entitled Waking Up, Climbing Through the Darkness. And I travel around the country and I do a lot of public speaking on mental health topics. I'll tell you about it in a few minutes. So there was a lot of things brewing at the time. On Christmas morning of the year 2000, I swallowed 200 Percocets and 60 doses of morphine with a pint of gin. And two days later I woke up and I found myself in ICU and then eventually on the liver transplant floor of a Boston hospital. I live in the Boston area. What had actually preceded the attempt was my husband's death. I met Peter when we were both working out at the same health club. Um, within a couple of weeks of that first date, we were spending all of our free time together. I have to say it is the first time in my life that I felt pure joy. I mean, really pure joy. And I was afraid. Uh, I think a lot of people are afraid when they find something that's so wonderful that they're going to lose it. So if you understand how important it was to me and what a big shift it was in my life, then you can understand a little bit more about how devastating it was when he was diagnosed. Terry came in several years ago to um, talk about how she could handle um, her husband who was dying of Lou Gehrig's disease. His decline was, was really just, just really quite sad and quite devastating and Terry was right there all the time and she really put up such a, a, a strong front. In the first year following his death, I was in a very self-destructive mode and, and I, was, I was drinking more alcohol, I was taking painkillers, I wasn't focusing on eating well, I wasn't focusing on sleeping well, and um, I was suicidal. Life became like an endurance test and that's really how it felt. It felt like life was an endurance test for me and making it to the next day and to the next was truly, it was just a fight for survival. Thinking back on it, I would have been more probing, you know, how are you feeling, and really dive into it. But I think people like me and other people respect people's privacy, and, and I respected Terry too much to cross a certain boundary. I think family members should cross that boundary, whatever that is, and just ask the questions and, and ask the uncomfortable questions, because if you don't, you're not going to know. There was never a talk screen done. So they, they, never, they never detected that I had taken narcotics. And I was never screened by a mental health professional in the ER or on the floor. Nobody ever said to me, did you make a suicide attempt? If there was education and awareness in the emergency room about what I was experiencing, they could have made sure that people were alerted in my life and that there were, there were people that were put on watch posts and that there was arrangements made for me to be in mental health treatment right away. There's a lot of things that can be done when someone's discharged from the hospital after making a suicide attempt, but in order to do those things, you first have to know that it was a suicide attempt. I was home from the hospital, and nobody knew what I had just gone through. So I was alone before the attempt, and now I was really alone. That's what brought me to her office. I went to her office with the hope that maybe there was some way she could help me tolerate being alive. But she just looked at me and she said, do you really think you're worth that little? And it still, it's, it still reaches me in a different way because when you get to that point, you feel so worthless. And, excuse me, to have someone believe in you that much. I think the key thing was not something 
specific I said, but the fact that I truly respected her and truly trusted her. And that sounds kind of funny given um, what she did, but I truly believed that together we could do the work and she could get better. One of the things that I learned when I was in treatment with Dr. Glazer was the impact that my death would have had on other people. We went through each relationship that I have, one by one, and we discussed specifically how would that person be told and who would tell them and would they be told the truth or would someone lie to them and what would their life be like without me. And I realized during this process that I was of value to a lot of people. To me, good therapy is like emotional archaeology. You pick something up and you dust it off and you take a closer look at it, then you dig deeper and you find something else and you dust it off. It's a process and it unfolds over time. Initially, our work together was to, to keep me alive and to make some significant immediate changes so that I could remain alive. And one of those changes was to stop drinking alcohol and taking painkillers and to make a commitment to therapy. Suicide doesn't stand alone. It doesn't just happen as the result of nothing out of nowhere. It's the result of something. My husband's illness and death really became the catalysts that brought a lot of other things to the forefront that I had been grappling with my whole life. If you've gone through your life and you've had traumas or you've had difficulties or you've had things that you think you've buried and then you have a significant loss or significant trauma occur later in your life as I did with my husband dying, all of the things that have been on simmer in your life come to a full boil. My first memory of thinking about suicide was when I was 10 years old. Walking across the elementary school field and I was on my way to school in the early morning and I was thinking to myself, I can't wait until this is over and it was my life. I couldn't wait until my life was over. Children can have suicidal feelings and that there are warning signs and there are warning signs for depression, there are warning signs for being suicidal. You don't just look at what happened the day before the attempt, you look at many things that happened in that person's life and you can go all the way back to when that person was a child. Suicide for me had become almost like a coping mechanism. And I, I learned in therapy that death wasn't the only way to end my pain. There were other ways to end my pain besides death. And one of them was developing coping skills and, and learning how to manage my feelings in a different way, which, which I did. And that was really the first step, is to go from feeling that life is an endurance test to being able to tolerate being alive. And then you hope that the unendurable becomes bearable. Then you hope the bearable becomes manageable. Then you hope the manageable becomes pleasurable. And, and so it's a process, but it, it evolved over time. The most crucial component to my therapy was compassion. That was number one. That was the most important to me, feeling genuinely cared about made all the difference in the world to me. We had to be able to bridge the gap between sessions. And I told her, why don't you write? Sometimes that can be very helpful. And it worked with her. The reason that I first started writing was because Dr. Glazer suggested it to me. And that weekend, I took my laptop and I went down to the bookstore. I didn't know what I was going to write about, but I opened up my laptop and I started thinking about you know, what I'd experienced and I started to write. And I found within minutes, hours, that my fingers couldn't move fast enough for my thoughts. Grace Talk is unique because it really offers a first-person account of what it's like 
to be a client, what it's like to be on the other side of the couch. I have an email I received from a woman that I have blown it up and framed it and it's right next to my desk so that I can read it every day. That I was going to commit suicide and I read your book last night and I decided to stay alive one more day so I could reread it in the morning and I woke up today and the urge isn't present. That, that was it. I mean, that was like the, the quintessential moment for me. It was something that held her over. You know, it was a lifeline that got thrown out to her that held her over for another day. So if I could save someone's life for another day, it's well worth it. If I was to sum up my life today, the word that I would use to describe it is fulfilling. Uh, I live a very enriched life because of the work that I get to do and because of the people I get to be involved with. There's, there's one thing that you, and everybody can do, and that is that they can always reach out for help. There's always somebody there that will offer support. And, you know, ideally, it would be nice if we could all have our own individual therapist with unlimited mental health benefits. But that isn't really the reality for a lot of people. But that's why I try to inform people that there are organizations like the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. You can call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and, and find support there. There are, there are support groups that are free of charge that will, that will allow you to come and, and offer you support. And many of those support groups are run by mental health professionals as well. So there are always alternative ways to find support. And regardless of what your socioeconomic status is or regardless of what your personal circumstances are, everybody's in a position to reach out for help and get support and not be alone with how they're feeling.